so first of all, um, thank you for joining us tonight. This is the second in our Talking Craft series of um, virtual artist talks. My name is Leah. I'm one of the exhibitions coordinators for the Saskatchewan Craft Council, and I have the pleasure of hosting our talk tonight. Um, our speaker is Kathleen O'Grady. She'll be talking about uh, her personal craft practice as well as um, a specific piece called Perseverance, which is on view in the From Scratch exhibition at the SEC Gallery. Uh, it is available to view until November 7th. Um, and um, the gallery is open from Monday to Saturdays from 12 till 5. Um, I'd also like to take this time to acknowledge that the land which I am on and which the Saskatchewan Craft Council occupies is Treaty 6 territory. It is the traditional territory of numerous First Nations peoples, including Plains and Woods Cree, Dene, Nakoda, Salto, Ashinaabe, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, we're all treaty people, and as such, acknowledging the land's history and relationship to traditional territories is one of many steps we can take to pay respects to the many Indigenous peoples whose practices and lives continue to develop and contribute to this land. Acknowledging the space we occupy and benefiting from in particular and unique on a digital platform, as we will likely have many people attending tonight who may not be in the same location as us. In consideration of that, uh, we'd also like to recognize that the technology we're using, um, their headquarters is located in San Jose, California, which is the traditional land of the Olone and the Tamian peoples. I'd also like to thank the generous support of the City of Saskatoon, as well as Creative Saskatchewan. Um, their support makes programming such as tonight's artist talk possible. And just quickly before I turn things over to Kathleen, um, I'll just remind everyone, if you're new to Zoom or if you're not, um, you should have seen a pop-up disclaimer telling you that we are recording the artist talk. Uh, we'll be posting it later on on YouTube with captions. Um, so if there's anyone who isn't able to uh, make it tonight, it will be available online later on. Uh, your microphone should be automatically muted, but if it wasn't, please take the time to check and make sure that you're on mute so that we don't um, get any noise interference. Um, we'd also ask that people please keep your camera on if you're comfortable doing so. Um, as it really helps our speakers to feel more comfortable with the online format of these talks. Um, Kathleen is happy to answer questions at the end of her presentation. Um, if you've already submitted questions with your registration, um, we'll be attending to those. Um, and if you would like to ask a question at any time during the presentation, you're welcome to do that at any time during the chat. So you'll see the chat function is available. Uh, you can open it up and have it on the side view. And we'll be posting some important information in there as well. And finally, I am excited to introduce Kathleen O'Grady. I will let her take it from here. Thanks, Leah. Thanks everyone who takes, has taken the time out tonight to um, to come and hear this virtual talk. I would like to thank the Saskatchewan Craft Council for uh, hosting this talk and inviting me to be here and speak tonight about my work. And a big thank you to Leah, Maya, and Vivian for um, setting this up. And um, and I guess away we go. So uh, thanks again. Um, I have two sections. There's the first piece will be about my um, art piece at the gallery called Perseverance. And then, and there will be a section for questions after that. And then I will go into the piece about slow fashion. So um, I do have a number of slides and um, we'll try and um, well, not go as quickly as I can, but, uh, and the biggest challenge uh, with doing and putting this slideshow together was deciding what not to put in because um, I had so many fun slides. So anyway, um, I'll start with um, a little bit about who I am. I'm both a clothing designer and a textile artist. I'm from Canada, from Saskatoon, and um, 
have lived away in different countries for a, a while, um, a number of years ago. Um, I was influenced by my mother at an early age and she was quite experimental in her work. So that experimental piece has also influenced uh, what I do and how I do. Um, and my travels in Southeast Asia, um, I lived in Greece for a year and Japan for two years and in the mid eighties and then have traveled to India and Africa and my travels to those countries have uh, uh, given me an appreciation of textile traditions from around the world and have informed some of my um, design decisions um, and work with textiles. And I like to combine old world sensibilities with contemporary design. And um, most people probably don't know this about me, but I used to have a floor loom a very long time ago and um, actually sold that to Daryl Bell a, a long, long time ago. So I do have a foundational um, history of knowing uh, woven textiles. And I also like to use uh, found fabrics that I find at garage sales or um, secondhand store finds and work those into my pieces. And I also work with natural dyes and incorporate those into my work as well. So uh, I'll start with uh, the, the perseverance piece. Um, and I'll just read this. Um, the name of the piece is perseverance. In the process of producing garments, numerous scraps of fabric end up on the studio floor. These scraps are often seen as worthless and discarded. Irregular and seemingly unimportant, these offcuts are beautiful in their own right. In this exhibit, scraps have been given new life as they are transformed from scratch into a new garment. The piece represents those who must create a new life from scratch after being forced to leave their homeland and settle in a new land, sometimes waiting for years in confinement before departing. Others have lived on the land for generations and have been forced to leave, ending up surrounded and contained by fences. The barbed wire motif and chain stitching symbolize the obstacles, physical and emotional, they must overcome. The shimmering lining represents the unique and resilient spirit within each individual. Uh, here's the front and the back of the piece. It's made of 100% linen. And um, I started the piece before COVID and I, because I have a background in clothing design, it was easy to choose a garment um, as sort of the palette as, you, as, it, as it is for, for the design. And I wanted a neutral tonal color as a background. And what I did was uh, I did screen printing and hand embroidery and uh, top stitch, machine top stitch as well. So it evolved from scraps on the cutting floor, from scratch. And I'd always wanted to incorporate the image of barbed wire into some of my artwork uh, and it took shape in this piece. So uh, it was nice that it felt like it finally, um, I was able to use that image. And of course, barbed wire is used to keep people in and keep, keep people out depending on what and where that is and who's making the decisions. I um, did the pods, um, the rounded shapes, I wanted to juxtapose the, the sort of um, sharpness of the barbed wire with something a little softer. So then the piece evolved to be about captivity and the thought of what it must be like to take your life into your own hands and make the journey to a new land with the hope of, be of a better life. Um, my first thought um, when I was creating the piece was about representing migrants from far off lands. And then one day I said, well, hey, wait a minute. What if you've lived on the land forever and um, you're forced to leave and be confined in a separate place, such as a reservation, in your own land, on your own land? So that's the basis of this piece. And um, yeah. Uh, so these are some of the scraps uh, that I've intentionally distressed. I threw them into the washing machine. And then I screen printed them. Um, the picture on the right is uh, the pods that I've screen printed. And by the way, I've had to tape all of uh, the, the scraps 
to the fabric or to the, the paper behind because when I do the screen print and lift the screen off, it will automatically want to pull the small pieces of fabric off of it. Uh, to the right picture is um, the panel, front panel of the coat that I was able to do random screen printing with the barbed wire. And then more pods to the right. Um, so the beginnings of the garment, um, this was it. And, and I really liked working in the, the tonal colors of um, the beige and the browns and the grays. And here I've got two spools of, uh, I think it's almost the same picture, but I liked the mother-daughterness of it. Um, and um, I have the embro embroidery thread uh, that I was going to use. And I have used that color on the inside of some of the panels. And then um, the ribbon um, up here, I was going to use ribbon on the coat, but decided not to in the end. And then uh, this is one of my favorite uh, pieces that I did, uh, or this photo of it anyway. Um, again, the distressed linen um, and then screen printing on top of that and then drying it um, and the slab of um, concrete there in our um, yard. It's just drying. And then um, I wanted to use embroidery to provide texture as well and I thought oh my god I haven't done embroidery for 40 plus years so I thought okay um, and I purchased the book on the on the left uh, by a well-known um, designer uh, Al, um, Natalie Shannon whose company is Alabama Shannon so I got that and I also went online to YouTube a number of times and forced myself in the wee hours um, to to relearn uh, embroidery which I, I found really soothing and of course remember this was during um, the beginnings of COVID and um, which for everybody obviously was a difficult time and being able to do the art piece um, well it took me through um, so I decided chain stitch that I thought was appropriate for the piece and um, here are some details of the coat um, back elbow on the right uh, the chain stitch is um, crossing the, over there and then um, the one on the left as well and it was nice because it would it was just all random um, which also made it more difficult to plan the piece because it's not like I just threw all the pieces together they were a number of times many times strategically um, placed on the the neutral palette um, right here in my dining room and then the lining, um, which you don't actually see unless you open the coat. Um, it's on a mannequin right now at the Saskatchewan Craft Council in the gallery. So the lining, I thought, put a lot of thought into that as well. And I wanted to have something that was uh, of, of lighter spirit than the outside of the coat, which in some ways can be very heavy. And of course, when you know the story behind it and the narrative, then it makes sense it, that it is what it is. Um, so I chose um, to use uh, silk taffeta that I um, put into the washing machine to distress it. And, um, and then as you can see on my cutting table, um, this is the pattern of the 649 plain coat. <laughs> this is the, um, the lining of, the, of um, I do all of my own patterns and I've uh, created a marker. I work with a technician and um, she digitizes all the patterns, all the designs, and puts them onto a marker. And the marker is laid out on top of um, the fabric and then is cut. So uh, more pictures of the lining. Um, the little the photo on the left is one of my favorite, one of my favorite pictures of where the um, lining meets the um, neutral color of the garment. And more about the lining. Um, I deliberated a long time um, for the closure of the garment. I, and I was clear that I didn't want to have buttons with buttonholes because I wanted to have a seamless, uh, really clean finish. So you'll see snaps that I decided to use. And when, when the garment is closed, you won't see those snaps at all. Um, 
So I thought that that worked out well. And we actually have a sample of the lining on display mm -hmm. along with the piece of the craft council, um, which is nice because you can't see it as part of the garment, but it gives you more information about the piece. Exactly. Thanks for that, Leah. And then here is, I just wanted to put it with some greenery. Um, and um, that's the back bottom. And, um, and are there any questions? We do have a couple of pre-submitted questions that I think would fit really well into where we're at. Sure. Um, one of them is, uh, what part of your design process brings you the most joy? Oh, right. That's such a great question. Um, gee, I can think of a lot of different uh, parts of my design process. Um, one is um, pulling a new vat, of, uh, being at the vat and pulling new scarves out of the vat after I've, after I've dyed them. Um, another one is, um, and I actually um, had this question ahead of time that I made some notes on because it was such a great question and I wanted to address it with a few of my notes that I can remember. Um, another thing that gives me a lot of joy is getting the right mix of functionality, detail in a garment, balance, symmetry, and simplicity. And what I'll say is that it's a lot harder to make a simple, clean design than it is to have a lot of design elements. So when I've achieved that in a design, um, I'm just kind of silently say yes. And, um, and the reason I know that is because it resonates with people. So the mixture of details and simplicity and functionality, as well as uh, being at the dye vat and um, pulling out a new bat, 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 a bunch of scarves. Thanks. Uh, another question that we had pre-submitted, um, which was, what most excites you about the process, the care and the fabrication, fabrication of fabric or garment in art that links with fashion today? Um, yeah, great question too. Um, and I made some notes on that. Um, I have to think about these things, um, which is good. And so um, the marriage of both of those things in terms of design, um, fabric, and then the design, um, intention, and good design, whether it's wearable, whether it's sellable. Um, um, so both of those things together, uh, the fabrication of, of that I'm using and the design. Now, I hope that answers your question. If anyone else has questions at this point, feel free to um, just type them into the chat. Um, if not, I think we'll move on to kind of the next section of... I, go ahead, Leah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I go ahead. Sorry. Um, well, there, I just wanted to remind everyone we will have another opportunity for questions at the for end. Sure. And so I do have a, a fairly... I have a number of slides that I'm going to um, go through, like I said, not quickly, but because I want to make sure that I cover them all, um, that... I'll go through quickly. And also this, there'll be a recording of this that this, the craft council will have up eventually on their um, uh, website. So uh, if you want to rewatch this, uh, you'll be able to. So tonight's discussion, uh, the second part is about slow fashion. Uh, but I think sometimes it's easier to talk about fast fashion before talking about slow fashion, because I think we all clearly know what fast fashion is. And, um, that is fast fashion is uh, speed to market, often compromising quality. It de it's dehumanizing the process and the workers and um, cheap and low prices. Um, so we all know about fast fashion and in uh, many ways we, we all benefit from it, but there is a price for fast fashion. Um, and as artisans and crafters, we know the work that, we're, that goes into something. So we know the value from our time and our energy. 
so I have a photo here of uh, a stock photo um, um, from a factory, clearly, uh, a factory line um, where the pay is low, there's long hours and dangerous conditions. Um, um, great quote by Lee Edelcourt, garments are offered cheaper than a sandwich, teaching young consumers that fashion has no value. Lee Edelcourt is a Dutch woman um, and one of the, one, uh, she's an influential cons uh, consultants in the world and she advises companies on sustainability and their practices and she's also worked with um, uh, just the big name companies, Coca-Cola, Estee Lauder, you name it. Um, Lee Edelcourt, and if you Google her name, um, it brings up all sorts of amazing things. And um, she's one of the biggest in the world for consultancy. And another of her quotes, um, in the age of COVID, it's time to invent everything from scratch. So I thought that was a great line that um, fit in with um, the talk tonight. And so that bodes well for crafters and maker makers, I feel. Um, so slow fashion um, is about intentional processes, valuing workers, it's values based, and it's about making a difference. And there is now a revival for sure. Um, so uh, one of the things we know is that in some less developed countries, globalization has created these factories. And the great thing is, that there's a wonderful tradition of slow fashion and textiles in these countries. And I've had the privilege to visit some of these countries and I'd like to share um, some of my travels with you um, into those countries um, uh, this evening. So um, here's me a very long time ago in 1983 in um, Paris, France at a, a famous um, market in Montmartre which um, I Googled that a number of years ago and it's completely changed of which I'm not surprised. 1983 was a long time ago. Um, and I lived in Japan for two years. Um, the Toji Temple market happened uh, once, once a month and I, I, I planned so much around it because it was such a find for fabrics. And here I am rooting through kimono, a silk kimono, by the way. And so they didn't value, that was a long time ago, and I'm sure it's changed now. Um, they weren't into repurposing any kind of uh, garments that somebody else wore. And if the person died in that garment, or that was part of their um, group of clothing, uh, they would just get rid of those and sell them. And another um, quote that I love is, um, uh, textile is a carrier of information. It's like a computer program. It's like a language and it holds a lot of culture. And again, this is what I love uh, is the fabrics and the culture and the people. And I've mentioned legacy and the legacy of textiles um, before when I speak of textiles. And what I mean by this is that these traditions are passed down through generations and are becoming more special because Globalizing, globalization is changing this very quickly. And a lot of these um, techniques and things are being forgotten. So fast fashion is happening in these countries, but there are wonderful traditions of slow fashion. And this is my passion. And what I love about it is the people and the cultures and the traditions and the textiles. So um, one of the countries is India. And I had the good fortune to travel uh, to Kerala, which is the southernmost state um, before going to Sri Lanka across the pond there. And so this is a, a tea plantation. And um, this was my morning view in the morning when I opened, opened my, my door. And those are all tea, tea uh, shrubs. More, more tea. And you can see the scale there of uh, someone um, uh, pruning and picking those tea leaves. And that was my, out my front door as well. So 
I was headed to this, um, to uh, Munar, which is where this is taken, this tea plantation. And this facility here is um, a, a large facility where it's a dye unit actually, uh, printing and stamping and all sorts of things. By, so the local um, uh, people who work the fields, they, um, you know, of course their children go to school and um, there may be um, children who are um, uh, challenged, physically challenged, um, and they're in the program here so that they're able to um, do the dyeing and um, work in the facility. This is the inside of that building I just showed you in the previous slide, uh, or one of the one of the buildings. Um, they're sitting around the table, um, stitching and probably clamping and um, stitching. And then the photo to the, up on the top is uh, two women um, sharing uh, their dyeing uh, skeins of it wouldn't be wool, it would be silk. And it's important to keep the wool wrote the, the sorry the uh, yarn rotating for two reasons one is that there may be sediment on the bottom and the other is that they want evenness of color so they have to keep rotating that with those two six sticks and then the bottom photo is um, a happy a happy worker working at this great facility here are the dye vats to the left and then what is so impressive to me is the size of this centrifuge that they would use. And by the way, it's, it's quite uh, humid down there in, uh, in Kerala, so um, they would want to take out as much water as possible. And then um, a weaving studio. And um, me, uh, quote unquote, helping <laughs> this lady on the left picture, um, uh, she's um, it's a machine that winds all of the uh, cotton or the wool and you can kind of see that behind her head and there's another one that she's working on. She was kind of lot enough to let me try it and I kind of messed it up and and anyway she was very kind and she undid it whatever. I mean I didn't make that big of a mistake but it was out of um, it's definitely a skill definitely a skill and then um, so there I am in the other picture I was wanted to go and sit on the floor with them and just be part of it. This was in 2018. And then I had to include this photo because I love India. And um, these were some of the street cows, um, very prized Brahmin bulls. And then on to Cambodia. So uh, Angkor Wat is a, a world heritage site uh, just uh, outside of Siem Reap. And those are the stone carvings. Um, I wanted to go to Siem Reap because I was looking for a gentleman named Dr. Morimoto. And Dr. Morimoto spent many years uh, working in refugee camps in Thailand teaching natural dyes. And then he was asked by UNESCO to go to Cambodia. I think it was 1992 he went, 92, 93. And they asked him to revive the lost Cambodian textile arts. And um, so he went to Siem Reap. And um, so in order to do that, to have a revival, he had to talk to the keepers of the knowledge that, that could pass the knowledge on. And he found it really difficult to find these people. So eventually he found um, quote unquote older, <laughs> older people, 60 year old women, I guess, who, um, and you know, whoever had the, the memory of being involved in the textile art, because during the Khmer Rouge regime, all of the, all of the looms were destroyed, they were burnt, um, people couldn't sing, and so they had to find people that could, could start again. So, um, and so Dr. Uh, Morimoto um, created the village over the years um, of, of Weavers and Dyers. And by the way, D uh, Dr. Morimoto is no longer here. Uh, he's been gone for about, uh, he died about a year and a half ago, I think. A huge loss. And there's Dr. Morimoto and myself. We took a drive in the country about three hours to get to where he is. And here's Dr. Morimoto showing me his indigo plants. 
and the vat that he has to um, uh, put them into and uh, process them. And then here's the weaver's studio. Um, by the way, it was a holiday, a big holiday, and most of the weavers and spinners and dyers had gone home. So he said, well, go out to the, 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 the workshop anyway. And this lady is, is seen here uh, wrapping the silk with banana leaf fiber to create a resist. And so she's wrapping it all and um, cutting it to make a motif and a design. And that will be put into the dye vat and then she'll do it again with numerous layers of that. Um, the uh, piece on the right is in Dr. Morimoto's sh um, uh, showroom. And then there's spindles, wooden spindles to the left. Uh, but that piece that we're looking at, that main piece, uh, has had numerous dips. Um, not, the, uh, not the top and the bottom because that's extra fabric that's sewn on. But to get a motif like that with all those dips is um, quite something. And then here are the, uh, some of the workers. As you can see, um, very much not fast fashion. So that's um, silk that they're spinning. And it was hot, it was so hot. I think it was March or April that we were there and uh, just incredibly hot. So no one is moving very quickly. And this young woman is weaving the piece to the right, which has been, um, you can see the motifs there that have been, that's the warp and the weft that have been um, done with a, um, it's called ECAT and that's intricately wrapped multiple wraps and multiple dips and that would be silk. On to Laos. Um, so um, my husband and I went to um, Thailand and then we were on our way to uh, Laos and had an accident. Um, not our fault, our driver, it wasn't a collision but um, um, we were um, going to meet um, my husband's um, people that he spent time with uh, in Thailand uh, in the Peace Corps many years ago, and he hadn't seen them for 35 years. And um, we got this letter uh, before we got on the plane to go traveling. And he said, yes, please come and see us. So um, we knew that he was there. But anyway, we had this accident, 12 of us in the vehicle. Uh, we were fortunate that the two um, uh, Israeli paramedics could get us out of the, the vehicle that we were all in because we didn't know if it was gonna blow up or not. So I decided, Scott and I um, hold ourselves up into a nice hotel in, uh, in Laos, in Vientiane. And I said, well, you know, there's this workshop happening for three days and I'm gonna go to it. So he stayed back and he read and I decided to do the workshop. So um, the bottom picture is uh, organic cotton and the picture on the right with the spinning wheel, that would be silk. Here's the um, indigo vats. And uh, this is indigo leaves that were gathered uh, from the mountains in the morning and brought in. I didn't dye with those because the indigo leaves have to be soaked and fermented some for a number of days. And so they left them in the bottom. The ones that I used were the, were the indigo leaves in the bottom vat. And so that gives a very different color, uh, sort of a sea foam color rather than uh, a deep dark indigo. And there I'm straining, straining the leaves to be able to, to dye with it. And yeah, here's at the workshop. By the way, I was the only one there because I think it was because they had a big holiday. So I had like four or five people teaching me and it was wonderful. And here's one of the weavers. I love her t-shirt. Um, and then um, I love the photo at the, at the left side as well. She's um, working the treadles of the loom. And those are bamboo treadles. Um, and those are all the skeins of silk that I dyed. Moving on to Molly. Well, I didn't actually go to Molly, but this was the next best thing because um, Abubakar Fofana is from Mali. Uh, he flies or used to fly all over the, all over the world giving um, workshops in indigo, uh, with indigo. He's a master indigo dyer and grows all of his own indigo. 
He uses organic cotton in Mali. And so he also teaches um, uh, um, mud resist dyeing. So he had a workshop in uh, Oakland, California in 2016. The moment I knew that he was having it, I registered and signed up. And they also said, hey, we're not sure if this is going to go through because he's not done this workshop before with the mud that he has to bring from the Niger River, as well as um, another plant that's used for a mordant. So um, uh, it was a three day workshop and I'm not sure what he's stir stirring there. Um, but the mud is from the ri Niger River and it's collected once a year. He goes with a group, a crew of his people and they have to dive in a, sp a specific place in the river that has crocodiles. So they, have, they bring up these buckets of mud and um, he brings a year's supply back to his studio in Mali. And then um, there's also uh, this plant that is being cooked and then it will be strained and used for a mordant to pre-treat the um, piece that I did on the left there with the Nigerian mud as a resist. And there's uh, Abu Bakar rinsing something. And then a photo with myself in the mask. But it doesn't make a difference. I think, um, is everyone on mute? I think so. I think oh, we're great. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, okay, on to natural dye work, some of my own. Um, and so um, here's here I am with my seven. Forgive me, Kathleen. I okay. accidentally well, muted you. No, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> So here I am uh, in my back, uh, well, it's not my studio, but it's the garage and my 72 liter vat, stainless steel, by the way, because it needs to be stainless steel. Um, and um, I'm using, that's Brazil wood that I've cooked to bring the color out and then strained that. And then I've mixed it with weld to get the orange wool scarf to the right. Um, and then here's a grouping of some of the textured wool scarves that I've done. Uh, and linen scarves that I've also done. Um, every, uh, I always weigh each scarf before I, to determine the weight of fiber, because the weight of fiber informs what percentage of dye that I will use uh, in the dye vat. Um, and here uh, you can see a gradation of, they started with the white, and then it was the mordant, and then it, I think it was an exhaust bath of Osage, and, um, and then Kutch. Here I've got some printing and stamping. There's that piece that I used um, or had made in with the Malian mud. Here's a before and after uh, with stamping with iron stamp and then, um, or iron solution and then putting it into the vat. And then on to indigo. Um, so indigo is a big topic uh, in a way. And, and if you've ever worked with indigo, you don't just dye with it, you have a relationship with it. And it's a complicated dye that takes years to master. And it's not just a color, it's a slow process to both produce the dye and to dye with it. And dyers can take um, and do uh, spend uh, years dedicated to just this one color because of its amazing qualities and its temperament. So I could never say that I'm an expert of indigo dyeing, but it has influenced me and certainly my name, uh, Gritty Blue, which is a line of clothing. Um, and I'm inspired by its magic, um, and including the beautiful color it produces and its practice by diverse cultures. Um, so there is a dark side to indigo, uh, the history of indigo, um, because of the exploitation of, uh, of the call exploitation of um, colonized countries and peoples. And um, it, indigo was one of the most valuable exports from the Southeast United States and the Caribbean. Um, India, um, and it was produced using the labor of enslaved uh, Africans. India under British colonization was a major supplier of indigo to Europe. 
and in Bengal, the farmers were forced to grow indigo rather than food crops, much to their, I mean, people died in droves because of that. And in 1859, the farmers revolted against the oppression by the East India Company in what became known as a blue mutiny. Um, um, in the early 1900s, natural indigo uh, was replaced by synthetic indigo and um, the indigo trade died up, uh, died out and um, was replaced with um, synthetic indigo. And that was the end of the indigo plantations. But there's much more to indigo's history than the dark side. And that is that indigo dyeing has been practiced since antiquity in India and Asia and Africa and South America. And there's been a huge re revival. Um, yeah. Now here's some of the pieces I've done. Uh, lin uh, linen with Itajime. Um, uh, it, it, itajime is a folding clamping uh, technique and that can be um, whether it's with uh, using boards or there's the silk rayon velvet as well that's below um, and um, a piece going out the door for a customer and then um, I've got my I'm realizing the time here uh, silk organza um, I'll have to go through these kind of quickly weld and it, itajime uh, the folding and clamping this beautiful yellow color and then when I put that into the iron salts dye bath and take the pieces of wood off, I get uh, the resist showing on the next slide. Um, and this is another piece of, uh, this is a mock-up for a natural dye symposium in Toronto with um, world speakers coming to present and that was um, disappointingly canceled. Here I'd like to talk about uh, some of my design inspiration and my design board at my studio. I've got uh, the Japanese symbol of water at the top. Uh, in the middle section, Betsy McCall was my first ever paper doll. And then in the middle right, uh, Fred Astaire and Audrey Hepburn dancing in the sunlight. And of course, um, Searching for Sugar Man, um, if, you've ever, if you ever get the chance to see that movie, you see it, it's amazing. And um, uh, a very influential book for me, um, Costumes and Pattern, Costume Patterns and Designs. Um, I lived in Vancouver. Uh, I came back um, from my travels in Greece and uh, Japan. So I was gone for three years and I decided to enroll in uh, design school. And I was in Duffy's Books, a famous bookstore, an uh, independent bookstore, um, and was perusing through the aisles and found this amazing book um, and uh, was blown away actually. So, um, and this book has influenced me a lot. There's the indigo. And here's a recent design that I did called the step tunic. And I, like, I haven't looked at this book for years, but because I've lived in Japan and Greece and was so much, um, I mean, I lived there. So those cultures I, I got to know and I had also traveled to Turkey a number of times. And by the way, when I was in Greece, uh, they still had the drachma at the time. So um, that was a long time ago. And I'm not even sure if they were part of the European Union. Here's my design studio um, with a feature wall. And um, when I walk into my, this is another thing that I find joy from when I walk into the studio and I don't even have to put the lights on in the morning because the sun floods in through the east windows. Um, the patterns, all of my patterns are digitized and standardized to size. I do all of the patterns. I work with a technician who uh, digitizes them and to end industry standard. And then the pieces are fit on to the marker and then, uh, then I cut the fabric out. And by the way, um, I cut out two or three layers in a big uh, in industrial commercial factory. They'll cut out hundreds of layers and, and that's the difference. And um, another thing I've mentioned here is to always check the marker because if the marker the marker is like pieces of puzzle, pieces of um, a puzzle, and all those pieces are put onto the marker and are printed out, and then I put that onto the, the, the fabric. If there's a mistake in the marker, you could lose hundreds of dollars if it's not done right. So the person who is laying that market marker up on the table, which is me, um, um, that it has to be done right. And just a note on fabrics. Um, 
big factories, um, they can leverage um, the number of pieces. They, if they do thousands of pieces of one style, they are able to negotiate the cost of fabric. They might pay $3 for the cost of their fabric. I would have to pay 15 or maybe more than that, um, just as an example. So, you know, it's quantity of scale here. And here's my shop rabbit and my pattern layout. Uh, this was part of a, a marker that had been cut out. And of course, I'm not gonna throw those pattern pieces out. I'm going to use them and leverage them as much as I can. Yes, and, uh, can, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Can you take yeah. a moment and just explain what a marker is? Sure, I'll go back. I'll go back to that slide. So I have all of the designs that are, uh, um, I do the designing and I hire a technician and those are, they're all digital. And then I, the, when, once the design is figured out and done well and ready to put to market, I say to her, okay, I'm ready to have this graded, which means taken from whatever I say, which is an extra small to an XXL. And she changes that and creates that in the computer. And that's put into a large PDF and this is the PDF right here. This is the marker with all of the pattern pieces on it. You can't, you don't get a, you can't really see that that well. But if you looked really close, you'd be able to see the front and the back and the pockets all on that piece of, of paper. And that's my guide for how I'm going to cut the fabric out. I, I hope that, does that clarify things? That's for me, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And then these pieces here to the right, they were on a marker at one point. And you know, there's, there's a lot of expense that goes into R&D, getting the pattern right, and then printing the pattern and paying the pattern a digitizer to do that. It's, it's expensive to create a new garment. So when I cut the, all those pieces off the marker, I'm not gonna just throw them away. I have to reuse those. Um, so that's what I have here. And then here's some current work, uh, the poet's tunic. Um, a uh, shawl collar, a uh, coat jacket, and then a uh, tunic or a uh, jumper. Thank you, merci. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. And if there's questions, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, I know that you could probably talk much, much longer about this, but we have some really interesting questions. Yes, I want to hear here. those, yes. Um, so the first one is, what do you think is the best way to engage with people about slow fashion with the goal of changing minds about where they purchase their fashion? Um, the, uh, it's always an education piece. Um, yeah, can, you, can you read the, the question again? What do you think is the best way to engage with people about slow fashion with the goal of changing minds about where they purchase their fashion? Um, I, uh, getting back to, yes, it's an, it was an education piece. Um, people love process. And I think that when people see process, where it came from, how it was made, who cut it out, and um, that helps to educate people to know where, you know, what goes into it. And then people can make a decision. Certainly, you know, when I think of my clothing, I would never expect somebody um, like a single mother or somebody living on a low wage to be able to go out and spend a goodly amount of money on one of my garments. Um, so, you know, they may be going to, a, they would be going to a store um, that has uh, certainly uh, less expensive uh, products, but it just gets into so much uh, of um, what you can afford, um, choices, um, Anyway, I'm not sure if it's, it's a big question. And it's a great question. And I hope I've answered it that correctly or that will satisfy the, the person asking the question. And if not, question. please get in touch with me. Um, I think that question actually leads really well into another one, um, which is, do you think sustainable clothing is accessible? Why or why not? Oh, great question. Um, um, I think uh, uh, one of the, the word sustainable has been used and I think it's actually overused now because, um, and there's a bit of greenwashing in it. Um, and then, so the question is, I'll, so do I, I wanna have a, a sustainable company? And then I have to ask, 
okay, what is sustainable? Does sustainable mean that I want to um, sustain my company throughout COVID and beyond in order to make a profit to be able to stay in business and do what I love to do to sustain my business? Or do I want to work with wholly organic uh, fabrics and organic processes? And those things kind of run on a continuum like a lot of things there's there's no black or white um so um is it can it be accessible um, uh, um yes and no it also has to do with quantity of scale um and it also costs a lot to make slow fashion um i, I hope that i've answered that as well that's also a really big one, <laughs> probably one that we can't answer. In. Yes, it's, um, um, I think I might have made some notes on that too. Um, um, looking at the word sustainable, um, that word being overused, um, um, and um, staying in business, paying the rent, paying the studio rent, um, accessible to the masses. Um, I just don't really think that that would work. There's got, there's always trade-offs and payoffs with um, the amount of work and time and energy that goes into the making of a garment. And I think I said this too uh, uh, at one point is that nobody needs, nobody needs any more new garments. However, then we get beyond, okay, what does a person need? What does a person want? So people want certain garments and certain designers and, and such for reasons, because there's an, an emotional connection or, some people have the um, means to be able to buy a more expensive thing. Some people don't. So um, it's always a trade-off between time, energy, and money. That's a really good point. For the um, maker and the, and, the, and the purchaser. Yeah, when you look at everything that goes into creating a garment, um, you think a lot of average people wouldn't be able to attain that without right. accessing fast fashion. but. That's right. Maybe so, we just don't need as many t-shirts. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So maybe we choose, uh, choose what, what and who we want to purchase from more mindfully and intentionally. And I really think that that's what um, COVID is doing, which is a good thing. Thank you, Kathleen. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. If anyone else has questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Um, I did have one more question I wanted to ask, yes. which is, um, do you think there's a notable difference between slow fashion and wearable art? Um, I think there's a bit of a blurred line there. Um, certainly they can be, um, wearable art takes time. Um, it depends on how much goes into it, um, um, how embellished it is, everything. Um, and slow, so certainly it's it, it certainly it's slow slow fashion as well. And there would be some people that differ, perhaps. I'm not really sure how that would be um, um, officially defined. Maybe somebody might do that. Yeah. Oops. Not what I want. Oops. Were there any other uh, questions that I may have missed that popped up? Feel free to post them again if so. Um, I will also encourage people at this time to please sign the um, guest book associated with the From Scratch exhibition. Um, we've posted a link in the chat. Uh, maybe we'll just post it one more time. Um, and that's a really good way to reach out to any of our From Scratch artists. Um, if you have questions or comments, we'll make sure that we pass those along. Mm. And feel free to contact me anytime as well if you, if you would like to do that. But certainly, Leah, as you mentioned, to, um, to go through you, to go through the Craft Council as well. Okay, um, oh, we have another question here. Um, question is, what is the shop rabbit? <laughs> the shop rabbit, I'll go back to that slide. Um, 
I love my shop rabbit. Um, the shop rabbit, <laughs> good, great question. It's called a rabbit in the industry because it looks like a rabbit and um, it's a hole punch actually. And so I can put, oh, I don't know, maybe eight. I, can, I, I put patterns in there and see the holes to the right in the, um, in the garments. I've got one in the pocket. I've got another um, in the bottom of the hem of the back. It punches holes in the pattern and then those patterns are put on a uh, hanger and they're hung up uh, on a string with a, a hook um, in, the, in my design studio. So it's, it's basically a hole punch that is, um, it's like a tank and um, does a good job. <laughs> Thank you. That was a really good question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great question. There's always a, 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 a satisfying feeling when you use the, the shop rabbit. Um, just it goes ka chunk, and you know you've got some good holes to hang up the patterns. Um, we have another question here. Um, what's one thing that you've learned from one of the cultures you visited that you try to embody in your pieces? Oh, that's such a great question and such a big question. Um, can you read it again? Just because it, it, what's one of, what's one of the what? I was actually hoping someone would ask this question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, question is, what is one thing you've learned from one of the cultures you visited that you try to embody in your pieces? Um, probably simplicity. Uh, again, getting back to simplicity and functionality. And when I look at um, traditional um, cultures and I and also because I have a background in weaving when I look at the simplicity of a piece of fabric um, it's key to be able to when I select a design how that fabric is going to best honor the fabric and create a new design and if I have a lot of um, design work and details and things and ri rib ribbons and bows in something that was hand loomed. Um, well, I, actually I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I would make a simple, simple design to honor the simplicity of the fabric and feature the fabric. So I think that's one of the biggest things um, and things that I try to do across the board and whatever I do is really honor the fabric. That's a really beautiful concept. Yeah, and, and like the book, the Tilk book, getting back to, um, uh, this book here is um, the simplicity of these like they're just squares they didn't have rounded um, they didn't make rounded shapes I mean the, the, the skirt at the, at the top is rounded because all of those pieces are sewn together but they didn't and the, but the ones on the bottom they just used um, the pieces that came off the loom that they wove that it took a village to create and um, that's the power and the simplicity. And I'll just add that when I found this book, and I always, I kind of joke about this, when I, the, the feeling that I got when I pulled that book off the shelf, this, this, um, at Duthie's, and I had just come back from being in, in, um, in Japan and Greece. I remember, I've said, I've never done crack cocaine, but if, I hear people talk about what it's like, but I just, there was like a physical, sensation a strong physical jolt that i that i got pulling this off the shelf because uh it was so amazing and i had just come from those cultures so it's informed just by osmosis what i do and how i do and my love of um different cultures and this there's sadness because these things are being lost um yeah what a beautiful beautiful keepsake um, I'm just reading a comment here saying, um, I've always marveled at how the Japanese kimono is designed around a narrow rectangle of fabric, similar to many other Eastern cultures, national dress. And yeah, that's something. De definitely. De the simplicity of that. And having lived in Japan and knowing that in order to make a kimono, it, like artists are assigned to make a kimono you don't it's just it's this whole zen of making it and of course the fabric and what is the fabric and what is the 
uh, everything. It's, um, I mean, of course that would be changed now, but you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, and even now to create a, a proper good kimono, you don't just bang out a kimono. There's a whole artisanal way of doing it. So again, it's valuing people's time, energy, well, and money. Absolutely, yeah. Um, well, unless we have any more last minute questions pop up. Um, I'm saying this really slowly for any of the people that are frantically typing right now. Uh -huh. um, but we are running out of time here. Um, so I just want to take the opportunity to once again thank Kathleen for taking the time to share her practice and her knowledge and wisdom with us. Um, and thank you everyone who contributed such thoughtful questions. Mm -hmm. um, and one last thing before we go, um, I would like to just invite everyone, if you'd like to, to um, turn on your microphone and we'll say a quick hello and goodbye to everyone here with us tonight before I shut down the meeting. <laughs> and thank you for every, everybody for coming. It was, it was so much fun. I always, I could talk for, for days on this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. Oh, hi, Judith. Nice to meet you. Yes. I will meet in person someday. I mean, yes, we actually did, but it was a long time ago, and I think it was Winter Green, uh, no, uh, Bazaar. <laughs> so yeah. I was one of many in the crowd admiring your thing. I, I think I remember speaking to you, actually. <laughs> yes. Oh, how nice to meet you again. Thanks nice to lot. see you again, Kathleen. Oh, hi, Martina. Martina. Hi. <laughs> oh, we did a workshop years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. With, uh, with uh, Michelle Garcia. That's right. Yes. Oh, yeah. that's great. Oh, I'm so glad that you came tonight. Oh yeah. You're, you're inspiring. I, I love to see what you're up to next and thank mm -hmm. you for doing this. Oh, thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. I, Bye. I enjoyed Bye. it. Thank you. And I like the, the perseverance. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye. Bye Ellen. Bye. Thank you, Kathy. Bye. Maureen. Oh, hi, Maureen. Oh, thank you. <laughs> mm, thanks for stopping in. You've done well. <laughs> mm, thanks a lot. Thanks, Kathleen. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you very much, Kathleen, from Montreal. Montreal? <laughs> Who's coming from Montreal? It's Shauna. Your your fan from Montreal, Shauna. Oh yes. my God! Oh my God! I'm so, wow. With my honor, I can't get my camera on, but I, I I follow you on Facebook, and I met you at the craft show here in Montreal. Yes, of course. I have the Saskatoon uh, connection with my sister who lives there. Yes, and I really I have your garments, and I really admire you. Oh, thanks. We met at the barn dance, Shauna. I met your sister at the barn dance. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> oh thanks bye. Wow. good luck bye oh thank you thank you Kathleen and good night, good night. from down the street <laughs> who's, who's down the street Pat Pat oh Pat yeah oh thanks. <laughs> oh thanks for coming Pat yeah it was very enjoyable thank you mm -mm. lovely slides oh thanks thanks well done oh.